In the year uh, 2001, uh, I ran into Alan Shapiro, quietly perched at the top of the Pyramid of the Sun at Teotihuacan. Is that not true, Alan? There you sat with your prism and silent face, testing whether the solar rays refracted as much in Mexico as in Minnesota. That is an example of your thoroughness. As we all know, Alan has given more attention to Newton's optical papers than Newton did. <laughs> he began to edit them at the age of 32, expecting to complete the job in three volumes before or around the age of 50. Ah, the illusions of youth. The first volume appeared to great critical acclaim in 1984. The second is in press. The number of years between the first two volumes is about equal to Alan's age when he began the project, from which it almost follows that 70 years from now, the project will reach its completion. Between volumes one and two, Alan published a vibrant account of Newton's theory of colors under a title with the unusual property of describing both the subject matter and the author's mental state in writing it up. Fits, passions, and paroxysms. The subtitle makes clear the meaning of, the, of this formula. The subtitle is Physics, Method, and Chemistry, and Newton's Theories of Colored Bodies and Fits of Easy Reflection. Quid clarius. While his Fitz and Newtons were in press, Allen edited a volume with the attractive title, The Investigation of Difficult Things. His contribution to it was a study of the watermarks in Newton's manuscripts. Noel and Jed are also there between the same hard covers. About Noel's contribution, I will inform you in 20 minutes. Jed's shouldered the heavy and perhaps impossible task of explaining why something did not happen, namely why Stokes did not write a treatise on optics. This seems just the right time for Alan to reveal Jed's experimental way. <clears throat> One thing I can add to um, talking about Newton and Harold Hartley, I don't know the details, but he played a crucial role with Tom Whiteside beginning the uh, famous edition because he always, Tom always spoke very highly and fondly, which is rare for Tom, of um, Sir Harold Hartley. I think he was the president of the Royal Society at the time. I don't know, but I'm pretty sure he was. And um, he encouraged the young Tom uh, and gave them gave him money, um, because he never he, not never he did not have a position at Cambridge at the university for many years uh, while he was working on it. Eventually, he did. Okay, um, to my talk. Um, one day in the spring of 1978, uh, Tom Kuhn came into my office at the Institute for Advanced Study, where I was spending my first sabbatical, to ask if I could help one of his former students with a paper. Fifty years later, I cannot be expected to recall exactly um, what Tom said, but it was something like, um, he was a really good student when he left Princeton um, for that other place. But they seemed to spend more time there talking than writing. And now he needs a little bit of help. The former student, of course, was Jed. Jed's paper was on Huygens and double refraction. And Tom knew I had uh, just written um, a large paper on Huygens and had, was working on the history of optics. In retrospect, I'm pretty sure Tom was engaged in some matchmaking while unloading the paper on me. Um, but, because the paper wasn't bad at all. Um, Indeed, it was pretty good. Um, Jed came down to the Institute, and we spent a good part of the day working on the paper. As best as I can remember, this was the first time we met, unless there was some incidental meeting at a meeting. Um, there are a few problems in the paper that were resolved that day, working together. 
And I remember we worked together and had a lot of fun doing it. Um, <clears throat> when published in the archive for History of Exact Sciences, one of the journals that he would come to edit a few years later, it was an important paper. This would not be the first time we would work together on a problem. In the 1980s, history of science, um, as you met by the age I know most of you remember, was changing significantly. What was then called internal history of science, primarily a concern for the development of scientific concepts and theories, and secondarily with experiment, observation, and instruments, was subject to a variety of critiques. By the 1990s, this had become a full-scale attack, and in the perception of many, an attack on science itself. This was the era of the science wars. To those of us who did the sort of history of science that was increasingly rejected and discredited, Jed was an increasingly important practitioner and supporter. He was, by this time, the director of the Dibner Institute at MIT. Not that Jed was digging in his heels and taking retrograde steps. He led a group of us, the Sloan Rangers, as we were called, um, and Trevor referred to it, in putting forward a proposal for the Sloan Foundation on, and this is the title of the proposal, The Nature and Limitations of Historical Knowledge About Scientific Objects and Their Investigators. Uh, the aim was to examine the possibility of gaining reliable historical knowledge about scientific entities and scientists' convictions about them. After three years of our exciting quarterly workshops, um, I had developed a much deeper understanding of the complexity of constructing historical knowledge. And do note how I learned to say constructing knowledge <laughs> through that. One feature that has long characterized Jed's work was assigning a prominent role to experimental practice, which was a theme of a number of our Sloan workshops. This removed the study of scientific concepts solely from the realm of the history of ideas, and as Jed wrote in another context, placed a work now I'm quoting from him, a workbench-like emphasis on the concrete sources of past scientific exper experience, and I think concrete is an important word here, whether embedded in objects, mediated by techniques, or displayed in words and images. That's the end of the quote. In the summer of 1998, Jed and the Dibner Institute held a one-week workshop for postdoctoral junior scholars on Cape Cod, a delightful location in the summer to examine historical and philosophical issues concerning such entities as the various 18th and 19th century fluids, chemical structures, and short-range forces. The focus was on the ways in which such entities came to life on paper and in the laboratory. I led one day session on Newton, the spectrum, and its subsequent history through the early 19th century. On the second day, uh, we set up a lab to repeat a number of Newton's optical experiments. The preceding spring, Jed and I spent a week in Cambridge repeating and working up three lab experiments. In developing the lab, we learned much from the experiments and each other, and I'll talk about it in a minute. And when I looked over the documents from the workshop to prepare for this essay, I was astounded at the perspicacity of the selectors of the participants. I was not one of the selectors. Jed was. Twenty years later, I recognize that at least six of the ten participants have become prominent contributors to the field, um, two of whom are here today, Theodore Arabatsis, Hassock Chang, Arthur Gall, Miles Jackson, Jessica Ris Riskin, and Friedrich Steiner, which is an amazing um, selection at the time. Um, Let me elaborate and give a brief sort of what I learned in summer camp story, or more accurately, an account of what I learned in the week Jed and I spent working up the experiments for the lab. Um, we began with the Newton's basic experiment. You all know this, you know, where he lets in, um, you know, this is not one I'm going to say much about, you know, the beam of sunlight through a prism of medium deviation and casts it about. Um, 18, 22 feet away, and you get a spectrum. Now, what's interesting is he gives lots of numbers here for the dimensions, angles, and all of that. Um, 
then we went ahead to the second experiment, which is the one I want to, I learned a lot from doing this. Um, the experiment in Crucis, the crucial experiment. Again, you, okay, the sunbeam goes through the prism, which will, you have two boards perforated with tiny holes, oh, about eight or 10 feet apart. And then you have a second prism, both of them are at uh, minimum deviation. When the rays go through here, you're gonna rotate the prism so you get different colors. Uh, the purpose of the t distant four holes is to make sure their incident, angle of incidence on this prism is essentially the same. You rotate it and you get, you know, from the extreme violet to the extreme red rays and you refract them separately. And what was noticeable was that the rays that reflected the most, refracted the most, the violet, it was significantly more than the um, red. It was, I couldn't find my notes on this. They no longer survive. But I remember it was a few inches. Um, and as Newton said, it was considerably, that's his word, um, difference, this distance. This immediately explained two important historical aspects of the experiment that I had never understood before that. First, why in, in contrast to the classic experiment, um, which I just presented, um, Newton presented no numbers here. Um, and, and that was because it was not something, the difference was significant. I mean, it was a few inches. And it was something that couldn't be uh, attributed to experimental procedure or carelessness. So that's why Newton pre had presented no numbers. And this then explains some historical um, facts that um, no one ever contested the results of the experiment, or maybe someone did, um, but certainly in the immediate decades after when they started to repeat it. Uh, they did um, contest his conclusion that we have over here um, that the light, sunlight is compound. That was much more controversial. But the fact that the experiment works this way, and so that's one of the things you can learn. You can learn, I mean, you don't have to do this experiment, but from actually doing the experiments, uh, you get a deeper understanding and, ex and experience that can provide insights into the actual practice and experience of contemporary scientists and and they in, inform your historical judgment. I want to return to the paper on um, double refraction. This is the paper um, in 1980. Um, this is the paper that first brought us together, but it was notable for at least for its methodology. The paper was concerned with the calculation of numerical results and techniques of measurement this reminds me of what Jed's doing with the, uh, all his apples there, right? Um, an observation of double refraction in Iceland crystal. In the long century, been Haugen's, between Haugen's proposal of law and Malou's confirmation of it. Jed meticulously examined both calculation and measurements and largely ignored theory. This approach was not then common in the history of the physical sciences, though it had been adopted in the history of astronomy. The concern for numerical results and measurements subsequently became more widespread. I did some of that too. Yeah. As it helped us to understand how scientists actually practiced experimental work and accepted and rejected theories. Hallmark of Jed's work in his publications, the conferences and workshops that he organized, which has influenced the broad community has been his concern with, for experiment, calculation, and scientific practice. From my perspective, that of someone work, who works in the early modern period, not Egyptian or anything like that, or even the 19th century, um, his longtime concern culminated in his paper, um, Discrepant Measurements and Experimental Knowledge in the Early Modern Era. By this time, this is 2006, Jed was the editor, a long time, or a co-editor of the archive. <coughs> um, he takes up the critical question, only occasionally touched upon by others, of how scientists deal with and repeat multiple measurements that necessarily will always differ from one another. And I, as I say, it's my, one of my favorite papers, not just by Jed, but by anyone. Um, 
not that Jed worked only on experiment, and others will talk about that, um, but I, first I want to situate his work in my recollections as to the historiographical scene in the 70s. When I started out, the history of the exact sciences, and more particularly the history of physics, was dominated by the history of astronomy and mechanics, especially celestial mechanics. This was all largely focused on Newton and the paths leading to and from the Principia. Gradually, other branches of physics began to get serious attention, perhaps because the younger scholars like me and then Jed saw great opportunity in fields like optics, electricity, thermodynamics, and electricity and magnetism. To be sure, many also moved into the more modern period of the 19th and 20th centuries. Jed made both those transitions, subject and period. John Heilbrunn, our eminent chair, published his important book, I think that's the one that Jed might have been tearing to pieces, <laughs> Electricity in the 17th and 18th Century, A Study of Early Modern Physics in 1979, and that can be seen as part of the shift and also promoting it. I mean, it was an important book to me. I didn't, wouldn't tear it apart, though. <laughs> but you say that was a compliment from Jed. <laughs> um, the books that I'm not going to talk about, and this shows how in, in this remarkable 10-year period of Jed, so I didn't realize uh, how, it, um, how much he did in this period that was related. He published, he wrote three books um, that were published then and edited another one, all on experiment or experiment in theory. Um, I won't say much about them, or I would say almost nothing, um, because I assume we're supposed to be setting the stage that these will be discussed by others. But again, we can see um, how theory comes in, both sometimes in the titles. Um, there's theory, but certainly it also worked with experiment. This one has both theory and experiment there. Effect is the experiment. And then this one, scientific practice theories and stories of physics. In all of these books, his emphasis was on the practice and the actual or well, the actual development and execution of experiment in the laboratory and the working out of new theoretical concepts on paper, taking into account how concepts and experiment interacted and were perceived by the participants at the time. In the older history, the principal concern was the development of theory and concepts and the key evidence supporting them. I don't want to go, as I say, further into them. This others, I assume, will do it. Um, at the last meeting of the Sloan workshops, where Trevor had mentioned, uh, in Palm Springs, in the spring of 1999, we celebrated Jed's 50th birthday. I am, to be sure, to be sure, delighted that he is still with us 20 years later, not to mention my equal delight at uh, my persistence. After a winter in Minneapolis, my wife, Linda, who knew Jed and many of the participants, joined us in Palm Springs. For the occasion, she wrote, and there's Jed. Notice he has a lot more hair than I got this off the web than in the first opening picture. Um, for the occasion, she wrote a doggerel 50th anniversary, 50th birthday tribute to Jed. Since it was of near epic proportion, length, I cannot reproduce it all here. I'll just do two stanzas. The penultimate one captures Jed's shifting interests in about that time. Um, and we can do this, if you want, like sort of a sing-along. I didn't know how to uh, program a bouncing ball like they used to have, but here it is. We know intelligence Jed does not lack, for after all, they gave him a Big Mac. But such diversity has he of talents and interests, it would be quite a challenge to peg or pigeonhole this Renaissance man. His host of high-tech gadgets must require his inner Mr. Fixit to perspire with wild abandon. His obsession with ancient statuary is a passion matched only by his love of Hittite lore. In any other, this could be a bore, but not in brave Buckwalt, who gladly cruises museums of the world and finds his muses in nooks and crannies of antiquity, where he with history mingles happily. Um, and the final stanza is still apt, Though, man, though Jed's a man of taste sophisticated, I think he'd be quite miffed and would re 
berate us did we not recognize that present laughter and simple joys of life are all he's after. For instance, he's been known to get quite frisky on English gins and drinking Irish whiskey. Although he's not averse to brandy French or any drink, as long as there's a mensch to share it with. So here we are to thank you and toast you and most certainly to rank you among the best and brightest that we know. Here's cheers and chin chin, mazel tov and skol. Thank you.